know if you were at the 8.30 service. Um, go ahead and be open up to John 14. Tim uh, taught the 8.30 service. And what he was really doing was exhorting some uh, prophecies, expounding it, giving uh, more wisdom. Words that have recently come to the church. Uh, how many of you know we're closer to revival than we were last year? And based on the words that he's been saying, um, uh, we may be very close to revival. The outpouring that we've been seeking all of these years. and, and uh, In fact, we're so, getting so close. Uh, I told you about um, so, you know, some of the invitations that come in uh, for Sue and I to go minister. We're always humbled when that happens. We, we, take, we don't esteem any of them lightly. And, these are people that love the message, they love Dave, they love the prayer center, they love us. And, uh, you know, if, if it's the Lord's will that we go, then we, we're certainly going to go. But uh, if he's saying, stay and die, <laughs> you know, I remember the message last, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, you remember that? Well, if you stay here, what's going to happen to you? You're going to die. <laughs> die to yourself. Your flesh, it goes, ow! No, not another hour praying in tongues, not skip another meal. No, ow, go to the first church. They'll tell you you're okay. <laughs> yeah, but they don't have revival either, do they? If they did, I'd be there. But we are going to have our revival. Well, I had to, because one of them is coming, really, those invitations, they, the timing on it was soon. And I, I just apologized, and I, I loved them, and I told them so, and I I would love to come. I've never been to that country. I'd love to go. But I said, based on the word of the Lord that we're receiving right now, i am already got a few meetings scheduled away from here that I almost kind of wish I had back. <laughs> because I know I'm supposed to be here uh, for revival, you know. So I've already declined one. Uh, and to be honest, with, then I got to thinking about it, and I told that person, I said, I got the listing all the other countries that we've declined just in the last six months. And I, I was surprised myself at the list. See, it doesn't matter. I've got to really phrase this carefully. It doesn't matter even what I want. It doesn't matter whether it's one where I want to go or whether I don't want to go. That has nothing at all to do with it. What matters is what does he want. What does he want? See, well, the, the one of the main prophecies, and this is the one, one of the main ones that was uh, Tim was exhorting on this morning, which was the perfect lead-in for the message that I felt like the Lord was going to have me deliver today, which is really kind of a restating of one I did many years ago. But the prophecy is this one came the last service of 2013 on December 29th. And uh, it came through me. And I actually had, had the, uh, I, what I heard, I heard it during the afternoon before that calling in the lost service. So here's the way it's worded. It says, what I heard this afternoon in prayer. This year coming up is the year where we sell out to him. Now stop just for a minute. I'm not going to redo what Tim did. See, if you've been here any length of time, If you've been doing this message any length of time, you're pretty sold out to him already. Well, I've been here 22 years. And I hear this and I go, did I not sell out to you last year? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, it came through my lips. And at the time I was confused. I was going, what? You almost, now I didn't think this, don't say I did. But I almost think, well, this must be for them. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> then during the next week, he shows me three idols that I have in my own life. And I'm going, but do they have any? <laughs> Get over yourself. We're all in this together. 
I'll tell you two of mine. I won't tell you the third one. It's embarrassing. None of your business. I'm, the Lord knows already. You don't need to go tell him. But the first two, they're relatively innocent in a way. I mean, you got to showing me, though, if I'm going to really sell out to him in my, in my life, football is not an evil thing. I think football is a good thing. I think it builds character in young men, teaches them teamwork and all kinds of wonderful things, see. But anything can become an idol if it takes too much of your affection and if it takes too much of your time. Over the years, there, so who knows, quite a few years ago, he weaned me off football once before because it was an idol in my life. This is, if I think it was five years ago, it was probably 10 or 15. <laughs> but I went for a few years and hardly even knew a score, didn't know hardly what was going on. But little by little by little, my affection for it uh, resumed. To the point, he says, it's an idol in my life. Well, I'm giving too much time to it. I got to thinking about it. Now, for you women, I'm not going to talk about your idols. <laughs> you let the Holy Ghost talk to you. I'm just talking, to, I'm a guy. Okay. But for a guy who's selling out to Jesus for revival on a Saturday, just ESPN football starts about 11 a.m., ends about midnight. <laughs> now, I didn't do all of that, but I'd probably do each game's about three and a half, four hours. Probably give it eight hours at least, if I want to be honest, eight hours on a Saturday, not counting Thursday night football. Monday night football. That's too much time for someone sold out to him. Now, he didn't say I could never watch football. But it cannot be an idol in my life. Those days of sitting there for eight hours at a stretch are over. You hear me? He might let me watch one or a quarter of one or something. Or a champion. I, I haven't got to watch the Super Bowl, I think, but once in the last 15, 20 years. Why? We have calling in the lost on Sunday night. But Super Bowl's always on Sunday night. I don't stay home and watch it. One year, he had mercy on me, and I was in Othello, Washington, and I got to watch it. Glory to God. <laughs> Idols. This is the year of selling out to him. I didn't finish reading it, did I? This year is coming up. This year coming up is the year where we sell out to him. There is going to be great division in the church, and I'm talking about the prayer center. With good intentions. Yes, sir, I hear this. Well, what does that mean? Get the message at 8.30 if you weren't here and listen to what Tim taught on it. It's, it's a Rembrandt, a Picasso. I don't have, if I do that again, we won't have this service, okay? There is a, going to be great division in the church, and I'm talking about the prayer center, with good intentions, but great warfare. Some will stay, some will go, and I am telling you, that's okay. Then I said at the end of that. It is the year of selling out to him. And whatever his will is, I don't live unto myself anymore. Got that? Um, did I tell you to go to John 14? If we're going to go into revival, we've been given a helper to help us go into revival. And I hate to tell you this, it's not Jesus. And I hate to tell you this, it's not the Father. Who did Jesus say would be our helper? The Holy Spirit. If we're going to really sell out to him, he's the one that you're dealing with. He is the one that is here. John 14, Jesus letting them know that he was not going to be there with them anymore. We're just hours away from the cross here. I've taught on this many, many times. He's letting them know. And after three and a half years of them following him, I, I know this was a shock to their system. They were not expecting this. They were expecting to follow Jesus into the new age or the new world or the new kingdom, the kingdom of God. They weren't expecting him to leave. But he's letting them know that he is leaving. And I've tried to meditate that, put myself in their shoes. You know, we have, we've, they tell them, we've forsaken everything to follow you. 
And I know they were glad that they did. The miracles they've seen, the miracles that God did through their own hands. I mean, I can imagine they're, they got a little basket of loaves and fishes, each one of them. And as they're, you know, it's this big. And as they're passing it out to thousands of people, it multiplies in their hands. Dear God. <laughs> and you're leaving? What? He'd send them to the cities. He sent them out to two by two to the cities. Go, go here. Tell them the kingdom of God has come. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Cast out devils and raise the dead. And when they tried to do those things, they were shocked. They come back and they said, even the devils, they are subject to us. Now that, in plain English, they obey us when we tell them to. Something is your subject, it obeys you. In your name... The devils have to obey us. They were more shocked than the devils, I think. And you're leaving? Is this over? But then he begins to introduce this other comforter. See, picking it up here. Verse 16, John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Boy, now, see, I didn't get the importance of that for a lot so long. See, they're going through heartache at this moment. They don't want another comforter. We want you, Jesus. We want you. And they're going through this heartbreak. He's telling them, I'm leaving. But he's encouraging them. Now, I'm going to give you another comforter. But listen to me. Listen to me. You'll never have to go through this heartache again. Because you're going to come to love this other comforter like you love me. You're going to come to trust him like you trust me. And the good news is, this one, he's not ever leaving. <laughs> and I like to phrase it like this. The Holy Ghost, he is stuck with you. <laughs> I remind him sometimes, you can't leave me. Especially after one of those heinous moments <laughs> where I really show my backside. Don't talk to my wife about this. I'm telling you. It's enough. you that's enough. You know enough. <laughs> after I've really been not so Christ-like, then I'm repenting all over myself. I go, Holy Ghost, you can't leave me. <laughs> I have scripture. You cannot leave me. You're stuck with me. Help me. Help me, Holy Ghost. I've done several messages where Paul concludes, I think, one of the letters to the Corinthians. I think it is. Don't write me letters if it's another one. But it ends up with, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. The Greek word there is koinonia. The koinonia of the Holy Ghost be yours. That word koinonia is the word you'd use for fellowship like with your best friend. We have got to even cultivate a better relationship than we already have. And I'm talking about Gary. With this Holy Ghost. We ignore him too much. We, we intellectually God. <laughs> Who am I preaching? Oh, so she's up here. I'm not preaching to her either. We intellectually get in arguments with people about our relationship with the Holy Ghost. And truth be known, other than tongues, we haven't talked with him, fellowshiped with him out of our soul in a long time. Don't treat him like he's real. Don't talk, don't talk to him at all. Treat him like he's an invisible something. And go to war with people that we have fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Pound on the table. I can't go there. I was uh, reminded of this vision that I'm about to read you, a little teaching vision that I had years ago. Talking with a friend of mine this week, this vision is still so clear in my spirit. Uh, I'll tell that part when we get there. This came in the waking hours. 
uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what year. It was 1998 when this came. I was out of the trucks. I was praying at the ugly building. And I don't know how many hours that day I was praying. And it's one of those teaching visions. It just opened up to me. Now, when I was sharing with my friend the other day, I, because the, the vision part is so clear and I know the street that it's on, I, I made a mistake. I said, I, I, I got this vision way back when I first got saved because the vision is in the street out in front of that house where Sue and I were living when we first got saved. And so when I was talking with my friend, I said, I, I think this happened within the first 90 days that we were saved, but it, it really didn't. When I found it on my computer, it was a long time later, 1998. But the reason it seems that, because it always takes me back to that house where we got saved, and I, the, the street that I'm going to read to you about in a minute, the street is in front of that house. So I'm just going to read it, and then we'll, we'll teach along. While in prayer today, I saw an aspect of the Holy Spirit that made me laugh out loud, but then it made me cry bitter tears. For teaching purposes, I saw the vision like this. I saw God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the Holy Spirit in heaven. Both the Father and the Son were sitting on their respective thrones, and the Holy Spirit was standing before them. Don't ask me what they look like, I can't tell you. The conversation went like this. A new son has been birthed in the earth. His name is Gary Carpenter. He is to have dominion on the earth in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, go forth and enforce that dominion. End of quote. I then saw the Holy Spirit come through space and time to where I live. And that's that, that house. When he arrived and found me, he found a spiritual child, a virtual infant. The born-again spirit within me was new and fresh and pure. But it was the most underdeveloped portion of me. I was dominated by the flesh and carnal thinking. I was hardly aware at that moment that there even was any, quote, new spirit within me. Now, you get this part. <laughs> then the Holy Spirit knelt down on one knee and began speaking to the infant spirit within me. Very tenderly, he said, I have come from the presence of the Father and the Son to enforce dominion for you on the earth. As you carry out the work of the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. But you are a child. If you will allow me to teach you and raise you up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You will grow up into the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. You will come to maturity and be changed into the same image as Christ. As you grow up into his image, I will progressively be able to exercise dominion for you in the earth in his name. Will you let me teach you how to use the power that I have come to manifest for you? What made me laugh was the sight of this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-holy being kneeling down to offer a baby training that would eventually culminate in the baby growing up to manhood and commanding the power that is resident within the third member of the Godhead to accomplish, quote, kingdom of God business on the earth. God, I like that image. It was so obvious that the Holy Spirit had all power. But he had no authority to use it without the child grown up. The child had all authority. But the power of the Holy Spirit could not be accessed unless the child grew up to conform to the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit was only authorized to enforce dominion, quote, in the name of Jesus Christ, unquote. 
Well, that meant that the child would have to grow up and understand the mind of Christ in order to speak words of authority that would line up with the plans, purposes, and pursuits of Jesus Christ. I kept hearing this verse in my spirit while seeing the vision. You don't have to turn there, but it's Galatians 4.1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing but a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now I see my relationship with the Holy Spirit a little more clearly. Today I am an heir, but I am also still a child. Although I am 51 years old, that's when I had the vision, although I am 51 years old physically, I have no idea what my spiritual age is. Perhaps two, maybe three, I don't know. But I do know... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but I do know that the Holy Spirit is desiring above all else that I spend time with him. Turn to your neighbor and say, time with him. Time with him. See, if we're going to sell out to Jesus, there isn't any other way to do that except spend time with him. Him who? Him, the Holy Spirit. He, the other comforter, the one that has been sent for this very purpose. Say it one more time. Time with Him. Say it this way. More than anything else, the Holy Spirit desires that I spend time with Him. Let me read that sentence again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hallelujah. <clears throat> but I do know that the Holy Spirit is desiring above all else, above all else, that I spend time with him so he can train me and mold me into the image of Christ. He desperately longs for me to grow up. Yes, sir. See, I, that word desperately, later on, I the Holy do you know the enemy will come and challenge anything that God says to you? Do you know the word is your only defense? Go to James somewhere. I hope I can find this. I wasn't planning on this. And again, this is a new Bible, so nothing is on the right place. Yeah, I found it. Hallelujah. James 4. In fact, let's hold, I've got it now, let's hold that. I see what's coming here. Let's hold that for just a minute. See that word desperate, no, we'll do, it. we'll do it now. He desperately longs for me to grow up. Later on, the enemy challenged me, said, the Holy Spirit's never desperate. That wasn't God. That's just coming out of your own head. What'd you say? Yeah, she already knows the verse. <laughs> James 4. See, now look, James 4, look at verse 4. The one we're after is verse 5. You adulterers and adulteresses. Now, by the way, if you read this in context, James is not speaking to people at that moment that were literally committing adultery. That's not the subject. The subject is, are you sold out to Jesus? Or are you living for the world? Or are you trying to have both at the same time, like Gary? Well, in some areas, can't tell me I'm sold out to him. Spend that much time, worldly things. Come on. We're going into revival. This is not kindergarten now. Okay? He says, you adulterers and adulteresses. What are you talking about, James? Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity? with God whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God when he's over here when he says he is desperately longing for me to spend time with him because if I don't where am I probably spending it yeah, one way or another 
And it could be innocent things, football, it's not so bad. The newscast, it's not so bad. Well, you'll get the world's view, too. If you listen to the news all the time, you're going to get the world's view of the world. And I know that for a fact. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And here's the verse. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain? The Spirit, and that really should be a capital S there. The Spirit, and he's talking about the Holy Ghost here, not, not your reborn spirit. The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth, lusteth to envy. What does that mean? You remember in the Old Testament, I am a jealous God. What did he mean? Not jealousy in a bad way? No, he knew he was the only God. Any time that those, his people were fellowshipping with, quote, any other, quote, gods from the other nations, they were really fellowshipping with devils. I am a jealous God. I am the only God. I want you and you only, and I am your God. There is no other. Well, what he's saying here, that Holy Spirit, he's lusting to envy. That's pretty desperate. What's he wanting? He's wanting to have the same relationship with Gary that Gary presently has with the world. He wants my affection to be towards him for eight hours, more than eight hours of football. And he's going to bless God have it too. My spirit is about to kick my soulish bottom. <laughs> my, my soul's rear <laughs> needs a good kicking. And I'm telling you, it squalls like a baby. It wants what it wants. Give me my sucker. Give me my ice cream. I want my lollipop. The soul is like a child. If you ever want to have a real good Bible study, go through the Old Testament. Go through Proverbs. Go specifically through Proverbs. Everywhere that it talks about how to, how to deal with a child, apply that to your soul and you'll, you'll do well. Spare not for it's much crying. <laughs> I want to watch football. I want to watch football. Pray. No, I hate it there. I die there. Pray. If that's not bad enough, and we're going to fast. What? You're killing me. I know. <laughs> I'm suffering. I know. Die. No. Ah. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost is going, finally. Finally. He's given me what I need. Hmm. Isn't that a scripture? So it's not wrong. That devil was a liar when he desperately longs for me. He wants that time. He's lusting to envy. He's jealous of my relationship with the world. He wants that same relationship with me. He wants it with you. Hmm. Go back to John. I think we're through in James. So I'm going to read that last sentence again. He desperately longs for me to grow up so he can exercise dominion on the earth in the name of Jesus Christ through me. Let's say revival. That's, that's the revival. So as I, and back to the vision now, or the, yeah, as I learn to follow his training, or I could say leadership, I will progressively grow from childhood to manhood. And stand up to full stature in the image of Christ. I will then be a son who is ready to participate in the family business. That is, to take my place in, quote, God and Sons Incorporated, if you'll allow me, on the earth. Nothing is more important than the time I spend with the Holy Spirit to receive this training. It is important to note that the Holy Spirit was not offended by my carnality when he first came to me. Get that image again? Here he comes, this newborn child, this Gary Carpenter, son of God, born on earth. He wasn't offended by my carnality when he came. He understood that everybody who is born again into the kingdom of God starts off carnally minded. He knew that I had no choice in the matter. 
I was born again in a carnally minded state. It was not my own choosing. And even when I would yield myself to him as teacher and sit down in his classroom with the stench of the world still on me, he was not offended by it. He understood my condition. He was pleased that I came, stench and all. What grieved him was when I chose not to spend time with him. But even when I chose the things of the world over him, he did not leave me. Now in this vision, no doubt for teaching purposes, I saw him standing off a little distance from me. Seemed to be about 20 feet or so. With his arms folded, just simply waiting for the next time that I would choose to spend time with him over time in the world. Yes, sir. So, John, go over to 16. First thing you need to know about the Holy Ghost. One of the first things. Start in verse 12, John 16, 12. I have many things yet to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He never drives you. He never forces you. He never demands it. He will stand there for all eternity with his arms folded and will never once override your free will. And you can be a Christian for 50 years and go to heaven and never even find the first stage of your calling. Because if you don't invite the Holy Spirit to help you, let's say it a different way. If you don't choose on your own to spend time with him, especially once you are accountable by knowing this message, and know how to do that. He will stand there one year, five years, ten years, and wait. And love you and help you. Do all he can for you. Answer whatever prayer, what I mean is manifest his power as an answer to prayer however he can. But he guides you into all truth. He does not drive you into all truth. He does not choose for you. You choose. This vision, more than any other, every now and then it comes back to me. Especially at times like this when he starts showing me, son, your, your affection is starting to drift towards the world again. I don't care who you are and I don't care how long you've been saved. You can backslide if you want to. People say, maybe they, I'm just going to pick something. Maybe they commit adultery. I don't know how that happened. Yes, you do. You weren't walking along and slipped on a banana peel and fell into adultery. <laughs> it was slowly, 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 little decision by little decision by another decision by another decision. Well, you, you can backslide in any area that same way. Well, I'm just not going to pray today. I, I know I, I, I told you I was going to today, but I'll make it up tomorrow. Sure you will. Sure you will. You're going to fast tomorrow too, aren't you? Going to, going to get the Bible out at home tomorrow and read it, aren't you? Going to turn off the radio and play the, play the MP3 teachings in your car tomorrow. I know you. Not today. Tomorrow. Decision by decision by decision. In a year or two down the road, you're backslid into something bad. You go, how did this happen? You didn't slip on a banana peel. It's a whole lot of decisions strung together. And don't get me wrong, you get lots of help from the devil. Gary gets lots of help from his unmortified flesh. Gary gets lots of help from the soulish part of him that still thinks I deserve better than I have. And the truth of it is, he's already been nicer to me than I deserve. He's nice to me like I'm, Je like I'm Jesus, to be honest with you. He gives me what he deserves. Hmm. I 
want to read this paragraph again. Is this okay with you? We're, we're doing okay? What grieved him, see, it wasn't the stench of the world. It wasn't, hey, when you, when you do sin, for the, do not run from God. You run directly into his arms and you repent and you tell him the truth. What does any parent want from their children when they messed up? Just don't lie to me about it. Be honest with me. Tell, you what, tell, tell me what you did. I'm going to help you never make that mistake again. And our fellowship is resumed. That's what every parent wants. And he's the, the parent of all parents. He even said that to the backslider in the Old Testament. Only acknowledge unto me that you've sinned. Repent. Don't run in from him. Run to him. So what grieved him, and I'm talking about the Holy Spirit especially, what grieved him, not an it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come. Look at verse 13 of John 16. How be it when it. Is that what it says? He. He. Just like he's, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In the same way Jesus is real and has a personality. And, and you know you can worship him and talk to him. And so is the Holy Spirit. It's, he is not an it. He is a he. And he, he, he enjoys the times of fellowship. He can be grieved. He can be pleased. You know, we're told don't grieve the Holy Spirit. But he can be pleased too. One way you can please him is pray in tongues. Spend time with him. One other way, acknowledge him that he's with you, with your soul. Good morning, Holy Spirit. A lot of people tell you don't do that. Well, I disagree. He is he. <laughs> okay, back to the vision. What grieved him was when I chose not to spend time with him. But even when I chose the things of the world over him, he did not leave me. In this vision, no doubt for teaching purposes, I saw him standing off a little distance from me. Seemed to be about 20 feet away or so. With his arms folded simply waiting for the next time I would choose to spend time with him over time spent in the world. I knew he would never leave me nor forsake me, never. His eyes were always on me, full of love, longing for my fellowship, but never willing to force me against my will to spend time with him. Then the, then the vision continued. And I saw a little farther down the corridor of time. I was about the age of six years old, spiritually. I saw myself with a stick hitting a can in the street. And that's what I mean when I see this vision. It's, I, I see the street. It's the street in front of the house where I got saved. So I saw myself with a stick out there hitting a can down the street. And I was just playing. The Holy Spirit was in his customary position watching me from a short distance away as I amused myself. He began calling for me. Gary, come away with me. Gary, come away with me. Gary, I love you. Come be with me for a while. At first I could hear him calling me very plainly. But in the vision, I didn't acknowledge him at all. I didn't stop what I was doing. I didn't even turn my head in his direction. I heard him. But going away with him right then would interfere with the fun that I was having at the moment. Now, just so you'll know, by the way, in my life, I don't think I've ever played hit the can with a stick. <laughs> and I can't imagine that being fun. But I think he was just drawing something up so general that it would apply to all of us. See, for me, obviously the, the analogy, sitting there watching football is kicking the can. Sitting there watching the news is kicking the can. It's all right to kick the can once in a while, but not when the Holy Spirit's calling. And to not even turn my head that direction, it's, I heard him. 
And I didn't even acknowledge him in this vision by even turning my head. It's like, I didn't hear that. Hmm. I didn't even turn my head in his direction. I heard him. But going away with him right then, right then, would interfere with the fun I was having at the moment. I liked what I was doing. I liked being a child. I wasn't even sure I wanted to grow up and assume the responsibilities of manhood. I tried to tune out his voice. He was calling for me in the most tender way. I don't want to read this. <laughs> but I was determined not to let his voice interfere with my fun. In the vision, the strangest thing took place. I could see me hitting the can in the street. And I could see the Holy Spirit calling to me from a short distance away. To be honest with you, I can see it just right now. I could see that street, and in the vision, he was standing about 20 feet away. We had a, one little spindly tree in the front yard of that house, but it was enough for a little shade. And he was standing under the shade, just standing there like this, like, it, like a parent standing there watching a child play out, you know, play stickball, kick the can or something like that. So I... <clears throat> I could see him, I could see me, rather, hitting the can in the street, and I could see the Holy Spirit calling to me from a short distance away. His mouth continued to form words, but the sound of his voice began to diminish. It wasn't that he was speaking any more softly than before, but it seemed to me that the volume of the sound itself was diminishing. Finally, I was still hitting the can in the street, and I could see that the Holy Spirit was still calling to me with the same intensity as before, but I could hear his voice no longer. I had become deaf to the voice of the Spirit. At that moment, the vision changed to a panoramic view of the whole earth, as if I were viewing the earth from a very high place. The nations were full of children all about six years old, all of them hitting cans in the street. Here and there would be an adult standing among the children. Their proportion was very small, perhaps one adult among 50 million children. Who were these adults and why were there so few? And then I just knew. Those adults represented the precious few men and women down through the ages of time who yielded their lives sufficiently to the Holy Spirit to bring them to maturity. They are the revivalists of history. They were so few. My heart broke as I watched. The potential for every child of God was so enormous, but their maturity level was so stunted because of the lure of the world. I knew that the vast majority of them would live out their lives and never mature beyond that six-year-old level. The entire world was desperately longing for the dominion that belongs to mature sons of God. But nearly all of God's sons were hitting cans in the street from somewhere close behind me, about 20 feet away. I heard weeping, and I wept also, and that's how the vision ended. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. It's good to be put in remembrance of that vision. I remember the last time that he had me get this out, and I'll just be honest with you. I hope this applies to you. I know it applies to me. I think it has everything to do with selling out to Jesus this year. And I don't want to advocate old-time holiness, although I admire them. They were just trying to please God. See, I remember sitting in some of that, even in the churches where I grew up as a little boy. I remember some of them. you got to remember, now this was going to date me with some of you guys. you got to remember, I remember when there was no such thing except a black and white TV. I tell Cole that, and he just looks at me like, 
I try and tell him, I remember when there was no, no cell phone. <laughs> what? Yeah, there was no, no microwave in the house. How did you live? You know, <laughs> don't have a microwave. How did you live? You know? <laughs> Reminds me of a TV show I saw one time where they said, why don't you use the microwave? He was doing something slow on the stove with a gas burner. He just pointed to it and he said, fire good. Pointed to the microwave and went, magic bad. <laughs> See, I can remember, I can remember them thundering how te te television is evil. You got to stay away from it. So everything, I mean, you know, they're trying to be holy. So that it went to the extent like Dave talks about. I didn't really, I wasn't into ultra, ultra, ultra holiness like Dave was. But it got to the point where even cutting a woman's hair is wrong. And you got to have... You know, it's that moment. You got to have you know, the, the skirts had to cover the ankles and, and uh, no makeup. Now, I like that other guy, that other preacher says, Look, if the barn needs paint, and paint the barn. You know, I mean, makeup is. But the Bible says, Don't let her beauty, don't let that be her beauty. The outward things. He, he didn't say, Don't fix your hair and put on makeup. He wasn't saying that. He says, that's not what's important, the outward beauty. What's important to God is that inner beauty, that meek and that quiet and gentle spirit that loves God. See? See? Well, he's not calling us to... He's not telling Gary, all right, throw the, throw the TV in the dump. And, I mean, where, there's no end to that. You know? I heard one preacher, he, he'd give up everything. He couldn't think of anything else, so he gave up Coca-Cola. It's got to be... Revival will come if I give up Coca-Cola. There's always going to be something, see? Now, what he's after is to grow up beyond that level. And again, I admire them. They were trying to please God. Don't get me wrong. But we're not going to go with that direction. What we're going to go to is purity of heart. Where we are owned by nothing but him. He doesn't care if I watch TV, but he doesn't want TV having Gary. He, he doesn't care if I watch a championship game or a quarter of football or something once in a while, but it can't be where that's my idol where I'm going to sit there and my affection goes to it instead of him. Besides that, there's too much kingdom work to get done. We've got too many sick, crippled. Somebody was, I was hearing the numbers again. We've got over between seven and eight billion now. See, I, in school, when, we, when Sweetie Face and I, Sue, with my mind... <laughs> When we were in high school, they were always talking about four billion. It was, we almost doubled in our lifetime worldwide. I remember it was four point something billion when I was in high school. Now it's seven point something billion and getting close to eight. It's, and do you know the small percentage of the world that is genuinely Christian? You talk about the fields being white for harvest. And not only, not just to mention, in our own midst, we have, we have members with children that need miracles. They're heroes of mine. Stay and pray and fast, and, and we've not yet been able to manifest the miracle. And Jesus would not let that go on for a day. I don't, don't tell me he would. And we won't either. If he can grow us up. Well, I hate to think about the hours. I think now, now that this vision has come back out in my, what I mean come back out, now that it's been brought back to the forefront of my mind, I, I, I want to run. I want, part of me wants to, I'm embarrassed that I would sit there those Saturdays, and hour after hour. Yes, once in a while I would pray in other tongues while I'd watch the game. Yes, that is better than nothing. That's better than nothing. But I do not think that's the Lord's plan for my life. Not for my life. He intends to take us into revival. Let me just tell you right now, if we get to the place where every time you lay your hands on a blind child, the joy from that is going to far outweigh football, touchdowns, <laughs> Super Bowl, whatever. And I, I, see, I can't speak to you women. You're going to have to, you know, I don't know what it is. <laughs> you think the joy, 
Let's see, why can't we, we can open, I can go down there, there's, I know there's 10 blind children that can receive their sight today. Or I could watch a football game. Where have we been, see? Where have we been? It is the year of selling out to him. Again, from this morning, I'm just going to talk about a little part. Remember it said divisions? And even with good intentions, some will leave, some won't stay. What's not in there is some other things that Gary said during that prophecy that came forward. So I am honest enough to know that if I'm the one that needs to go, I'm willing to go. Gary, make that more clear, okay? I've asked the Lord. I've opened up myself to the Lord. He knows everything, does he not? Okay? If I am so... At, at, at age 67, if I am so stubborn and set in my ways that I cannot change, or to say it another way, I'm not willing to change, to the point I am an obstacle, I said, Lord, get me out of here. I esteem your revival more important than my life, and whether I'm a part of it or not a part of it. If I'm one that needs to go, you said it was okay. If I'm one that needs to go, this is my prayer. Get me out of here. Because I want your revival more than I want anything else. See, I say that, then I go sit and watch football for eight hours. Something wrong there. So all I'm telling you, this is the year of selling out to you. And less and less time is going to be spent on things of the world for me personally. Because I'll be, I, I do believe this message. I believe we have this Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. I'm going to go ahead and say that too. It is important that you talk to the Holy Spirit from your soul, not just your spirit. Your soul is going to have to humble itself. Now, this is a preview of coming attractions. I've been thinking about this a long time. You know, we have something we call the inner witness. You're not going to find a whole lot of verses in the New Testament that use that phrase. You do find a few verses that says, He, the Holy Spirit... I think it's Romans 8, 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Bears witness with our spirit. So there you have both. There's the Holy Ghost, and He bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But when we, when we say things like, I felt led, or the inner witness, you know, or green light, red light, what would are we really saying there? That inner witness is a person. It's you. It's your born-again spirit that's got a conscience with the Ten Commandments in it. <laughs> Is that said a different way where you can get it? Nobody has to teach you. The instant you're born again, you know it's wrong to steal. Nobody had to tell you. It's a spirit on the inside of you. When you spend time praying in other tongues, it's your spirit talking to the Holy Ghost. And your mind don't like it because it's left outside of the loop at that point. And sometimes I've made decisions where my rational mind went, are we crazy now? What happened there? My, my spirit man, I felt led. Okay, fine. My spirit received instruction from the Holy Ghost that my mind is refusing. It's, uh, the Holy Spirit is not withholding his voice from my mind. My mind says, I ain't going to hear that. Nope. Talk to the hand. I ain't going to hear it. Not going to do that. Nope. Not dead enough. But see, if you spend time in worship and fasting, you, the goal is to bring your soul, all of you, the unrenewed part of you, even if it's still unrenewed, at least make the sucker bow. <laughs> make it bow the knee. And sometimes you'll make decision and your rational mind will say, What? Well, what happened there? That's your spirit man on the inside that's been in fellowship with the Holy Ghost. If you've been praying and said, we're supposed to do this. And the natural mind goes, no. But if you spent time with him, it'll bow. Look, later on, you'll look back and go, oh my God, that really was him. That wasn't just a witness. That's your spirit in agreement with the Holy Ghost that made decisions that your natural mind had to bow down to. Even when it didn't understand. That's really what's going on there in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that we talked about a week ago. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Why? 
that we learn not to trust in ourselves. What part of ourselves? Your soul. The part of you that fixes stuff. <laughs> the part of you that says, let me figure out nine ways that we don't have to die. The answer was stay and die. I got nine ways we don't have to do that. But see, it doesn't really. Not an accomplish the kingdom of God purpose. So your soul has to bow. And even when it doesn't always understand all the details. God, I can't even tell you the number of times that's happened. But he goes, got to go that way anyway. Why? I, don't, I can't tell you. That's the way we got to go. Well, there's part of you that can't. That if you could articulate it, there's part of you that can't. Yes, sir. 1 Corinthians 14. Did I tell you to go there? Man, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, look at, we'll just start at verse 14. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful, okay? My spirit prayeth. Remember when Dave, chapter 8 of Dave's book, where he talks about the spiritual mind? Boy, that was a week, yes. <laughs> Anyone ever read chapter 8 of Dave's book, The Walk of the Spirit? Okay, we got a few, okay. Remember he starts off talking about Lazarus, you know, and he's got a tips of fingers and a tip of tongue and your, your spirit man has tips of, we say we know, I love that phrase, our spirit man we know at least has tips of fingers and a tip of tongue. <laughs> and he could see, he could see, remember? So we know our spirit man has eyes. So remember the teaching? Inside your physical finger is a spiritual finger. Inside your natural eye is a spiritual eye. Inside your natural brain is a spiritual brain. There, your spirit man has a brain, has a mind. That's the one, when you're praying in other tongues, that is direct communication between your spirit and God the Holy Spirit. They're direct communication. Your spirit man is understanding. But your natural brain, at that moment, does not understand. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. These things are, the things of God are, spiritually discerned. Well, that's why praying in tongues, it circumvents that natural soul. So you can really play the will of God whether your natural mind wants to go that way or not. <laughs> anyway. Now, once your natural mind gets that lesson, there is a time where it's, it's mysteries being communicated. Some of it has to do with your calling. Some of it has to do with revelation knowledge of the word. There's all kinds of mysteries. But as your spiritual mind processes the information it's receiving from the Holy Ghost. The way I understand it, my, it's really my spirit that kind of turns around to my soul. The one that's been sitting outside the, the Holy of Holies reading Field and Stream. <laughs> or, I mean the Bible. While I was praying in other tongues, you know, it's going, it don't understand. That's spiritual talk. It's going, What? To, it, to your soul, it's gibberish. But once that revelation comes in your spirit, man, fully, whether it's a decision, whether it's a revelation, whether it's an instruction, your spirit almost like opens up the curtain. There's your soul sitting outside. It goes, hey, check this out. And that's when you get the revelation or the teaching vision or something that makes it understandable to your intellect. So here when he says... <clears throat> Let him that speak... No, I'm, where did I start? Oh, yeah, verse 14. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Now, it's still the Holy Ghost giving the utterance. But he is doing that through your spiritual mind, using your physical tongue. But my understanding, your soul, your intellect, at that moment, well, it's unfruitful. Well, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit... I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what you say? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I should have started two verses, two or three verses earlier. Look at verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, interpretation of a tongue is one way for understanding to come to the mind. God will interpret it for you through a gift called the gift of interpretation. And 
He just does it for you. It's a gift. You can't make it happen all the time. Gary, how do you know that? Going on. <laughs> I've tried. You can't make that happen. It's a gift. Okay. But he says, but verse 18, I think, so the goal here is to edify the church. Now, back up here earlier, he says, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, he edifies himself. But like Dave has taught us, the reason is the same. As you speak in an unknown tongue, communicating these mysteries, if you're doing it privately, your spirit is being educated, just like in this vision here, by the God the Holy Ghost. And he's growing up, he's maturing. And as you mature, your spirit, it begins edifying, instructing your soul. But if you do it in a corporate setting, or like I'm doing right now, really, I'm edifying the church. But I'm doing it based on spending a lot of time edifying myself. You see? Sharing things that have come to edify. Now I'm sharing that to help edify the church. So he says, verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding. That by my voice I might teach others also. Than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Well that, that's so simple. What good would it do for me to stand here for an hour and a half and just sit, stand here and pray in tongues? I would be edified, but you wouldn't, unless you prayed in tongues too. But that when we get together like this, that is the time for sharing the edification, the mysteries that have been explained to me, or maybe a prophecy that he's giving. Or he may, he may drop a prophecy that needs to be interpreted. He does that through Dave all the time and speaks directly to us. You don't have to go, you know, he, he just gives it to us free. I said all that trying to get to verse 20 that goes along with this vision. So brethren, be not children in understanding. Let's stop right there for a minute. I want you to picture Gary, six years old, with a stick hitting the can in the street, just having a big time. I'm saved on my way to heaven. Was going to hell, but now I'm saved. Kick the can, or no, hit the can. Go get the can, hit it again. Makes a rattle when I hit it. Hit it again. Maybe I got some other guys with me. I'll hit it to you, you hit it to me. But I'm saved on my way to heaven. Glory to God, hallelujah. Child in my understanding. Truth, God loves me. Been filled with the Holy Ghost. Want to hear me talk in tongues? I'll shun die while I kick the can. <laughs> but see, in my, in my understanding, I'm a child. Saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, on my way to heaven, God so loves me, pleased with me, glad I'm saved. Maybe I'm living right, taking care of my family, but I'm spiritually, I'm a six-year-old, you know, spiritually very immature. When he says this, <clears throat> be not children in understanding. Uh, I've got the definition here. That Greek word right there for children is paideon. P-A-I-D-I-O-N. And it means an infant or a half-grown boy or girl. Not man or woman. Half-grown boy or girl. Figuratively, an immature Christian. Little, young, a child. He says, in our understanding, be not children. How be it in malice be your children. Little children don't normally plot murders, revenges, vengeance, getting even. Children don't normally have a five year plan, a 10 year plan, and a 20 year plan, do they? But he says, but in understanding, be men. Now the word men there is teleos, T-E-L-I-O-S, and it means complete um, in growth, complete in growth, complete in mental and moral character. It means completeness of full age, a man even uses the word perfect, but it, what it means by that is mature, okay? 
In our understanding, be not children, but be men. Well, Gary has backslid somewhat to kicking the can in the street. That is over. This is the year of selling out to him. Got to cut myself off from those things. Yes, sir. I'll just be honest with you. I don't think I would be here right now if I hadn't obeyed him last year about pushing away from the dinner table. Most of you know I've lost 41 pounds in the last seven or eight months. I'm no, no, no applause. I mean, that was sheer obedience. He told me. He didn't ask me. <laughs> but it's always up to me whether I obey him or not. And it was not fun. It was not pleasant. And I learned things about fasting that I've never known before. <laughs> I knew it wasn't pleasant. I still know that. <laughs> but I did learn some other things. Okay. And because of that. See what. Yes sir. How do I say that? That thought has flit, flit, it flew by me about three times. To bring that back around. I'll try and say it this time. That's the way my flesh felt right there. <laughs> hmm. I started to do a message today titled Withdrawals. Withdrawals. Um, whenever you, how do you judge if it's an idol? Well, take it away from your life and see if there are any withdrawals. If there's, so I don't know exactly what you mean by that, Brother Gary. I'll tell you a simple way. Fast a few meals. You will understand withdrawals. <laughs> that thing in you that craves... Uh, Man, I need a burger. <laughs> I need, and it starts negotiating. I don't, not, not the Big Mac. No, uh, no. Just give me the little 50 cent burger. I'll leave you alone. The lion of flesh, it won't leave you alone. What it wants is the Big Mac with the fries dumped on top of it, all smothered in chili and two fried pies on the side. That's what it wants. And a strawberry shake to wash it all down with. And that's just for that meal. About an hour later, it's going to talk to you again. But that's just, I'll tell you, withdrawals. Fasting, you're going to find out real quick about withdrawals. Okay? When I had to cut off from the football, yep, sure enough. Oh. Questions. Wonder what the score is. What is the score? What's the score? And you find yourself want to take a walk in the yard and see if anybody's got the window open. <laughs> uh, I, I, I say, who's be watching this? I need to talk to them. Let me call them. Maybe I can hear it in the background on it. <laughs> the news for me. I, it's withdrawals. I can feel it. There's a craving in me. It feels this, very similar to fasting. You can kind of judge if it's an idol. Cut it off and see if you feel the withdrawals. If you do, it might have too strong a hold on you. Hmm. Wasn't that fun? Verse 20 again. Brethren, be not children in our understanding. Dear God, I don't want to get to heaven and have him show me that I spent 30 years kicking the can in the street with the Holy Ghost standing there in the shade all the time with his arms folded saying, come and be with me. See, in that kicking the can, it could be anything. You could be building a ministry all that time, just doing it your way instead of his. could be innocent things. I'm not against golf. I'm not against bowling. I'm not against it. What do women do? What do you guys do? I don't know what you guys do. Cooking, I guess. Cook, I don't know. Shopping. Show shopping. Okay. I don't know what. 
you know. But I don't, none of us want to stand before him that day. He said, you know, I sent you the Holy Ghost. He just stood by for 30 years, 40 years. Every once in a while, you'd go spend a little time with him, you know. I don't want that to be the case. So for me, yes, sir, again, here it comes again. Where's that? We find that prophecy. Let me say it again. We're going to lose people this year. I'm just telling you right now. Gee, that's a revelation. We lose people every year, Gary. You're, you're quite the prophet. You know, you're quite the prophet. I'm telling you. <laughs> I can safely prophesy. We have a confession in the calling in the lost. One of them says, no one ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. And I always want to say, yeah, they usually leave madder and all get out. But anyway. <laughs> and usually mad at Tim. Usually mad at Tim. They're never mad at Dave. They're either mad at Tim once in a while or mad at me. But usually it's Tim. <laughs> There's going to be great division in the church, and I'm talking about the prayer center. There's going to be people that are, yes, sir, golly. And I don't have this prophecy with me, but I can give you the picture that comes with the prophecy. This was sometime in the last year. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm very open. But the way I saw it was a picture, and the Lord was prophesying, say, I'm drawing the prayer center more into an inner circle. You do know he had an inner circle. You know that? Peter, James, and John, he took them up on the mount. All right, I'm drawing the prayer center into an inner circle. He says, you cannot come in that circle without laying down your personal agendas. And there's going to be people that try as they might, they cannot lay it down. And they won't spend enough time with the Holy Ghost where he can separate them from it. And they're not going to be able to come. I think this is the year. You're going to have to lay down. Get, I'm going to have to lay down. If I still have any agendas in me. Gary's way. That's not the Lord's way. That's, I can't go in there. The, he's drawing the circle tighter. Or you could say the path is becoming narrower. However you want to. And you're going to have to squeeze in there. And that means some stuff's got to get squeezed off. With me. He's been squeezing me in. So I can get in there. Anyway, so that division, there's going to be some that's going to become a division between us horizontally. There's going to be some divisions. Prophesy. We're going to lose some people. But then also with good intentions, there's going to be great warfare. I think a lot of that is going to be internal. As he separates us from idols, as he Shows us things that we just can't take that with us into revival. You just can't take it with you. For one thing, it just takes up too much of your time. It's, a, it's, a, it's not going to be the most pleasant year. Divisions horizontally, some separate. You remember Jesus said, we always say the Prince of Peace. Yeah, he is that. He also said, don't think I came to bring peace on the earth. I came with a sword to divide. Sometimes it's him. That's why I said, Lord, if, it, if I'm in the way and I can't change, separate me from here. And I'm serious about it. Now, I'm not planning on going. I have no desire to leave. Don't, I, don't, I don't read stuff into this that I'm not saying. I'm really direct. I don't innuendo well at all. So, but I'm just saying, if that was the case, I would, I would please. I want the revival, don't you? But let's not be like that. Let's be... Whatever needs to separate from me, let's separate that. And let me get into that inner circle. Lord, squeeze me. Squeeze me into a more narrow way if that's the path of revival. Y'all okay with that? Put yourself in the vision. Go with me out into the street for just a minute. Just a minute. We're having fun out in the street. Hitting the can with a stick. Yay, fun, fun, fun. And let's all look collectively. Let's look towards the shade tree. And there stands the Holy Spirit. He's been waiting a long time. I'll just say it. You can amen afterwards. I'll just say, this is the year, Holy Spirit. 
that we're going to stop our amusements. And we're going to spend that time with you instead. This is the year of selling out to him. Can you amen to that? Amen. Amen.